Hi, Dekai. Hi, everyone. So we're connecting with Professor Dekai, who is based in Hong Kong in the name of the Bosphorus Summit. So the Bosphorus Summit uh, started these uh, series of live conversations on uh, what we're going through uh, during the COVID-19 and uh, what we expect to see after hopefully this COVID-19 uh, phase is over. So Dekai, welcome, welcome online with us. This is so exciting to have you. Pleasure, pleasure yeah. to be here. Yeah. Well, I'll give, you, I'll give a bit of an uh, introduction about who you are because you're an amazing person, apart from being a dear friend. Uh, so Dekai is a professor of computer science and engineering from the University of Science and Technology of Hong Kong. And he's also a distinguished research scholar of International Computer Science Institute, Berkeley. He's an uh, artificial intelligence professor. He's a machine translation pioneer. Uh, he's the founding fellow of the Association of Computer Linguistics, and he's the inaugural member of Google AI Ethics Council. So basically, you are teaching machines how to speak and how to behave. Can we say that? Well, yeah, well, we're trying. <laughs> Long way to go. Yeah. How is it going so far? How, first of all, how's the COVID going? How's the Corona days going there in Hong Kong? Uh, you know, Hong Kong has actually handled it very well. So during these last uh, four and a half months, I've not been able to uh, return to my Berkeley base, uh, sadly. Uh, but uh, normally, because I see both sides of the Pacific very regularly, uh, it was um, really striking to see the difference in the approaches between Hong Kong and the US in handling COVID. Um, it was um, on the one hand taken extremely seriously in Hong Kong, which has handled it very well. Yeah. Uh, in January already, uh, in late December already, uh, we were talking about it and uh, planning measures. So for example, the University of Science and Technology here in Hong Kong was supposed to have started classes on February 1st, but throughout January, we were already planning and we never actually opened the campus physically. We were already set to do the entire semester of teaching online. Uh, and, and everybody uh, was not only already doing social distancing and the government had set up uh, for testing and for contact tracing, but everybody voluntarily already put on masks starting in January. Uh, and, and that means like 99% of the population, uh, this was measured. And, and so, on the other hand, in the US, I, I had a chance to see other parts of the US in January, in mid-January, um, and it was uh, being completely disregarded. Uh, people were talking about the coronavirus, uh, yeah. and uh, then in February, people were beginning to look at data of what countries were doing about it. And to my alarm and my increasing alarm, uh, nobody in the West uh, or outside of East Asia was talking about this universal wearing of face masks, uh, which was such an important part of the success in all of the East Asian countries uh, that managed to su suppress the exponential spread of the virus. And that's not only Hong Kong, uh, it's uh, also South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, um, and uh, Singapore, mm -hmm. uh, later followed by the Czech Republic and Slovenia and Slovakia. Yeah. Uh, it's like a hundred percent correlation between the countries that successfully fought down the exponential spread of the virus and universal masking. But what I was seeing in the US and in large parts of the Europe uh, of Europe and, and much of the developing world today is still not understanding how important it is for almost all of the population, 80 to 90% of the population to be wearing masks Mm -hmm. uh, in order to be able to stop the exponential spread. And, and so that really worried me, like half the population wearing masks is just not good enough. And we are still seeing that in many countries in the West and around the world. Um, that half the population wearing masks, according to our studies uh, that we've been working on that are very much in the international news these days, uh, it, it has almost no impact on slowing the virus because yeah. of the exponential behavior. And so we, we um, um, started uh, to look at different countries in Europe, other four collaborators all, all over Europe. We lost you a little bit uh, as you were speaking, uh, Dekai. Could you repeat your last uh, sentence? 
Yes. So uh, four of us, uh, sorry, five of us, four collaborators in Europe, uh, um, with, who you know include um, Vishal uh, Nangalia in uh, Royal Free Hospital in London, Alexei Morgunov, uh, who is out of Cambridge but is bunkering down in Estonia during the virus, uh, Anna Rotkirch in uh, Finland, and Guy Philippe Goldstein uh, in Paris. Uh, we banded together to try to do something about this. We did a, a lot of new empirical uh, validation of the hypotheses. We built two new theoretical models um, and they really uh, uh, have taken off in terms of the uh, viewing. Um, the uh, empirical models look like what you're seeing behind me here. <laughs> I'll just move yeah. aside. Yeah. Uh, We, we lost you again. Slow the spread, but if only half the population is wearing masks by day 50, it doesn't slow it down enough. If you wait until day 75 after the outbreak, it's just not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a four minute video that uh, we can uh, uh, send people yeah, to, to look yeah. at. I think we will share that link uh, with our audience uh, following this, this uh, interview so they can go and check out the video. Because it's Absolutely. very enlightening, actually. So you're right. I mean, you're, you're saying basically as a message to everyone listening to us and to all governments, basically, is that the use of the mask uh, really is an important factor to diminish the spread of this disease. And uh, this will make it easier to normalize the whole situation. Uh, am I correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, tell me then, like, um, so this has been a very interesting experience for every single human on this planet, right? Because uh, we all of a sudden had to stop uh, our, you know, day to day lives and be confined into one space, not travel, not move, not leave uh, our houses. And we had to be more creative in terms of the way we work, the way we interact with our friends, with our family, uh, or the way we handle ourselves. So like, what do you think this, this corona has taught us from the technological point of view? Uh, what do you think it has been changing in the way humanity has been interacting or behaving? Well, um, a couple of thoughts on that, obviously. One of the interesting things to me is that uh, these coronavirus times have simultaneously, and it's a little bit of a contradiction, uh, makes it interesting, they've simultaneously brought us back to um, our physical humanity, just because we've been locked down, we can't travel, we, we're uh, around those people in our immediate neighborhood, and in many ways reconnecting with that, which I think has been healthy for uh, a lot of us. And at the same time, ironically, it's driven us further very quickly into the virtual world. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we are we are spending time now together in the virtual world uh, as our oh, yeah. Yeah, you're yeah, in Hong Kong, I'm in um, Turkey, yeah. Uh, and uh, I think many of us has been doing a lot of these, uh, all the way from serious conversations to all the uh, dance parties online <laughs> that people are doing. Uh, so it's it's a very interesting way that it's driven us uh, to these two extremes of remembering our physical uh, humanity and, and our physical environment and what we can do to improve that, but also pushing us to explore. I, I, I would guess that 80% of the population at least is using tons of tools, beginning with Zoom and all of these others, that uh, they had resisted learning for uh, years uh, and now out of necessity uh, have really oh, this is actually kind of nice. I am actually seeing um, colleagues that I normally don't get to see very often, friends that are around the world, and I'm actually spending more time with them than I, I used to uh, in the, when I had to physically fly to go see them or something. So this is something that's really nice that I think the tech has brought to us and uh, may stick with us past the virus. I think the other thing technologically, um, I teach uh, an AI ethics course at the university and we focus on many issues but very strongly on the problem of information disorder on misinformation disinformation malinformation and we see over and over 
uh, the striking effects on society of that. It's an unintended consequence of the technology uh, that has brought us the internet, wireless, AI powered social media, as well as AI powered search engines. And those AIs today are already de facto deciding what you don't see because they can only show you the top 10, top 20 posts. You don't have time to read more uh, or search hits. And so they're deciding, oh, well, here's the billion posts in the last day that I'm not going to let you see. Wow. Uh, That creates- AI is picking it for us, so to speak. So AI is doing the picking for us uh, based on all our behavior online. Exactly. It's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's um, de facto, it's algorithmic censorship. Yes. Um, you yes. know, I, I think we delude ourselves. Oh, it's not censorship because the material is out there. Uh, it, nobody prevented you from posting it. But if there's no way for people to find it, 99.999% of the people can never find that material, then de facto, this is algorithmic censorship. And there's no way around it. You just, we just don't have enough time to see all the posts. Some yeah. algorithm has to decide for us. And so this is one of, this is a foundational problem in AI ethics that I've been focusing on. And we decided to study the uh, disinformation uh, problem in uh, the COVID domain for obvious okay. reasons. It's okay. an excellent case study because we saw right from the start a huge amount of misinformation and disinformation and malinformation even being propagated to this day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and was really instructive. We started mapping out the kinds of memes that were being created and the motivations behind them and the consequences, whether intended or unintended. But the most interesting thing about this whole thing is that uh, we really find that that what is happening is that the AIs that power social media and search engines are uh, um, in search of profit. So they're in search of maximizing the number of clicks uh, that their users make and the amount of eyeball time that they get people reading what they're showing them because that's where all the advertising revenue is. And so uh, what happens is that the AIs learn very, very quickly the way to maximize profit is by appealing to our very natural, evolutionarily hardwired, unconscious cognitive biases. Oh my God. And we have hundreds of those unconscious biases. Um, you know, we have overconfidence effects, pseudo certainty effects, Dunning Kruger effects, ambiguity effects, bias, blind spots. And so AIs have learned to prey upon our unconscious biases in order to maximize profit. And this is, this is insidious. This is, is very dangerous. It undermines the foundation. Free, even in a free atmosphere that we think uh, you know, the internet is, uh, in a way. So we, but we are kind of like self-limiting because at the same time, it, we're, our, uh, our um, previous uh, choices define what we receive online, right? Uh, could we it's say exactly. that? Yeah. Very much. Uh, we, yeah. Uh, and, and we're unaware of it because these are <laughs> unconsciously, <laughs> yeah. No, if we, if we sit yeah. and ask, what are your unconscious cognitive biases? Um, you know, like, like I wouldn't be able to answer. Yeah. I don't know because they're unconscious, um, you know, and and great psychologists and cognitive scientists have studied these, um, you know, people like, um, Tversky and Kahneman, Danny Kahneman, you know, who wrote the bestseller thinking fast and slow talks about a bunch of this. Um, and, and so, you know, we started asking, well, how is this affecting how we are failing in our response to the coronavirus? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so this, you know, there are very broad effects. So for example, um, the AI powered social media amplified very much our unconscious representativeness hur- heuristic. Yes. And that means that we make wrong predictions based on our experience of similar events in our experience. And so for most people outside of East Asia, you know, or even in East Asia, it was SARS and MERS and Ebola uh, and things like that. And so in the West, it was heavily, um, you know, unconsciously thinking, oh, it's going to be another one of those. It, it, it strikes um, funny looking people on the other side of the world and we don't really have to worry about it. Well, in and Spain, so, I, I was in Madrid when the whole Corona happened and uh, they took it lightly. They thought, no, it's just another type of flu. And look at where they got, you know. So you're right. Many people took it very lightly. 
and it did yeah exactly else. yeah and, so, and, and that ended up you know heavily causing much of the west to throw away the two months of extra warning that the west had before the virus really struck there uh which was terrible right that's that's a huge lesson that we need to learn uh, on, you know social media powered by ai's we're also busy feeding our present bias uh, the present bias is an unconscious kind of bias that focuses us on immediate payoffs, uh, you know, instant gratification and future trade-offs. Uh, and so everybody was like, well, if we do anything, this is going to kill our economy. Uh, and not bothering to think, th think through that, oh, gee, the economic damage is going to be exponentially larger because we didn't do anything about it today. Um, but if you looked at the social media in the West in January, February, it was all full of that. Uh, mm -hmm. It was amplifying those kinds of messages. Um, mm -hmm. Everything's okay. Uh, it's just like mm -hmm. a bad flu uh, and so forth. And, you know, there was a lot of other sort of general things. So um, AIs were dri driving polarization and, and hatred with memes like um, Chinese eat bats that causes COVID. Um, you know, and Chinese don't eat bats. Um, it, the scientists overwhelmingly think that it, this was natural animal to animal and then to human uh like many viruses evolve and and you know wild game is actually eaten in most of the world not only in china uh but because you make more profit ai learns to appeal to our confirmation bias uh because that's what we're going to read it triggers fear it triggers oh, outrage a story received <laughs> becomes the more real story so to speak even though it's not lot yeah lot Lots, lots of money, you know, it, it triggers our empathy gap, which is another bias that, uh, you know, like we don't, we don't say that H1N1 swine flu is the American virus, even though the American CDC says that is where it started. Um, and it kicks in our defensive attribution bias, which uh, is an unconscious bias to blame someone else more and more as the consequences become more and more severe. Um, and that plays on directly with economy as well, because of those biases, you know, there's like these economic wars, uh, there are uh, preferences in terms of where you do trade with, uh, which country you work with. So it actually has a monetary effect as well uh, on a larger scale. It, it absolutely does. There's, there's a lot of um, framing bias going on around this that causes you know the choice of how you metaphorically describe these situation mm -hmm. drives people to make a, a decision or take an action that mm -hmm. has major impact economically mm -hmm. uh and in terms of trade yeah. uh and you know it really really also leans in on the reiteration effect which makes us believe things because of repeated exposure as opposed to uh, rationality. So familiarity with an idea overpowers rational thinking. Yes, yes, um, yes. So, you know, I, I think that um, with, with things like masking and, and you know, testing and so forth, it was really crippling in our Western response. And mm -hmm. we don't recognize enough that the causes for our, our slow, um, fatal, uh, reaction speed uh, comes from our blind acceptance of the illusion that somehow having um, uh, all this information somewhere on the internet is good enough and that we don't really have to think about what that information disorder is doing to our mindsets, to the mindsets of our policymakers, and you know, to uh, picking the right choices. There was so much that was discussing in, in the media, the social media about, you know, things like, is this an escaped bioweapon? Um, yeah, you know, it's, 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 that, yes. it's a Chinese bioweapon. Oh no, it's an escaped American bioweapon. All, all this kind of, like so much oxygen has been taken by that, despite the fact that overwhelmingly scientists, uh, specialists in the field say it's- As well, those not, stories are entertaining. So I think that's that, you know, and uh, yeah. Um, you're right. And, but I, I want to also talk about, you know, the effects of, of this, um, you know, post-COVID era. Uh, I sometimes feel like maybe this was a way for humanity to kind of pass on to this, uh, the, uh, the digital uh, era that we're slowly moving into. And this has kind of made it a little bit more 
easy for humans to get used to that, to get used to this kind of technological interaction, to get used to not moving, but getting things done or delivered, et cetera, or doing business without having to physically be in places. So is this a way for us to be more easily getting used to the new normal, the new normal, which is a digital age? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, the, the wonderful thing about this, and, and again, and they're both sides of the coin. Uh, so, so like the, the, the really nice part about this that I think we should hang on to is, for example, that carbon emissions have dropped by 17% already, mm -hmm. right? You, I mean, think about all the trouble we have been having worldwide in trying to get nations to commit to much less in terms of the targets in reduction of, on carbon emissions, yeah. right? We've struggled for decades, you know, from Kyoto yeah. onward, we have countries pulling out of the Paris Accord, who I don't have to name. Um, and, the, uh, and, and the thing is, we have a once in a lifetime chance here because this has forced nations to take the uh, economic hit short term, uh, show that yes, we can actually uh, reduce the carbon emissions. Yes, there is an impact on our economy and we have to rethink from the ground up how we handle these crises economically. But because we have no choice, we are actually doing it. Yes. Uh, and it would be a real shame if, let's say we get past the COVID uh, crisis, if we just let go of that. That is something that we need to hang on to. We need to say, okay, we've begun to develop these infrastructures where we can really make a serious difference on climate change and sustainability. And let's see how we can make use of the right kinds of technology to continue doing that. Uh, so that's, I think, really very much on the positive side. And uh, obviously what we're doing right now, uh, virtually is a great part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the flip side, I think one of the things that we need to watch out for is that as we increasingly move everything online, mm -hmm. uh, all of these things are now, because they're online, now they become the, uh, the uh, beans that AIs are deciding whether to spread or to hide. And so suddenly now we've handed the AIs even more power to exponentially uh, take this and, and whether unintentionally or not to drive divisive polarized uh, conversations in where a conversation like this that we're having now maybe only gets shown to people who already agree with uh, the various things we're saying and never gets shown to people who actually might benefit from the alternate perspective and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so I think because we haven't tackled that problem, mm -hmm. because the conversation on that is still, I have to say, largely in denial. You know, there are so many voices that are just saying, well, you know, fundamentally we have this principle that we're going to allow um, uh, the um, freedom of expression to say, to put any sort of of misinformation out there and we're going to allow for-profit AIs to decide how to maximize their revenue by showing whatever misinformation or disinformation or malinformation maximizes their revenue. Um, you know, that is another exponential problem. That is just like masking, a problem where if you only have um, uh, protection against 50% of that, it will make no difference on the infodemic. And the interesting just thing like, is- Just like biological viruses, uh, misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, those are information viruses. Sure. Uh, they're viral memes, and they have exactly the same exponential behavior as the biological viruses that we're tackling, which means that you need the overwhelming majority, 80, 90% of people being somehow protected against that in order mm -hmm. to actually tackle that. And you, you know, information accuracy is the lifeblood of successful democratic, democ um, democratic governance. So we have to face that problem up front and ask what hard choices are we gonna make uh, about what kinds of antibodies we need, men mental an antibodies we need and AI powered antibodies we need in order to keep our information 
relatively virus free so that we can have successful democracies going forward that don't suffer from the kinds of damage that we saw with the coronavirus where that is so, so many people have needlessly lost their lives. And that's just the first uh, of the pandemics like this. There could be much worse pandemics coming down the road where uh, that kind of uh, misinformation driven poor plan uh, planning uh, could be an extinction event for humanity. Wow. So this is actually something which you say is very enlightening because nobody's actually aware of what's going on with all of these preparations uh, in the AI world. We are not even aware who is actually designing this world, who is actually uh, working on the ethics of the AI, who is uh, tackling these issues of misinformation or how AI is driving uh, itself because it's, it's kind of like it's, a, it's kind of like a living organism right now. It's kind of like uh, growing on its own, growing up on its own like a kid, right? So um, who is actually behind this? Who is there trying to make sure it doesn't get out of hand? It, or is there a body like that? Is there like an international association? Are governments involved? Are these professors? So can you like enlighten us in, in that respect a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, uh, a growing community worldwide in the field of AI ethics and society uh, just in the last couple of years. Um, it's very young at this point. Uh, there are uh, think tanks, um, for example, the Future Society uh, is one that I serve on the board of. Um, but then there are others that are in governments. There are uh, uh, bodies that are national, and those tend to reflect sp specific cultural approaches to, to that region. And then there are places that are, are trying to bridge that and, and bring together uh, a more or holistic worldwide view, because just like with biological pandemics, uh, it's very hard to control this type of phenomena within uh, a, the borders of a single country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But th then do you think with AI, we're going to be more, more free with, uh, with information or how we're influenced by information that we receive because we're all, we're, we're constantly connected online. Um, or are we going to be more homogenous as humanity uh, on this planet? Um, I think that we need to be both. So this is a little bit like the contradiction we talked about with the coronavirus making us both more aware of our physical humanity and our environment and also going much more extreme in the virtual world. We're going to have to do that. But it's that actually makes sense because, you know, the what we need is one way or another, whether it's in our own human training of our human minds, or whether it's the AIs that are the infrastructure that circulates information these days. In both cases, the antidote, the antibodies uh, to information disorder come from a few things, critical thinking, um, be, having an open mind, uh, looking at a diversity of hypotheses, uh, empirical, uh, a focus on empirical validation and on statistical validity and logical consistency, right? So these are critical thinking skills that are the only way to tackle this. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no way to make the correct choices democratically if we don't tackle that. And, you know, when we look at uh, the big picture, what did humanity do that was successful to increase that kind of critical thinking? Well, you know, since the enlightenment, it was the scientific method. What is the scientific method? It is number one, observation of the data. Look at a lot of data, look at it hard and observe what's happening without your a priori biases, uh, right? So scientific method that is all about trying to compensate for those million years of unconscious cognitive bias that evolution hardwired into us, right? Uh, and then the next step is having actually observed the data to look at hypotheses that are possibly opposing each other. So you don't just follow the first idea that you have. This avoids confirmation bias. Right. And so instead, we honestly lay out multiple conflicting hypotheses. We flesh them out. We give them all, you know, like a fair chance. 
we do screen them according to whether they match the empirical data or not. Um, so uh, once we've narrowed down a range of reasonable hypotheses, then we go and we look for the empirical validation. So we either set up experiments or we count what's happening in the real world. Super important not to avoid counting that up and making sure that there's logical consistency with what we're hypothesizing. Mm -hmm. And when we finish that, we, add, we do hard error analysis. We look at where did our hypothesis go wrong? What are we missing? Most importantly, what are the contexts that we miss, right? A lot of the information disorder is not about just simply fake news or fake facts. A lot of times it's actually the, the things that are reported are not untrue, they're actually true. The problem is they've been reported in a way that completely misses the context, right? So mm -hmm. the information disorder is omitted context. So for example, if, if you were reporting, say that, um, oh, I don't know, the, um, uh, the police were beating a protester or something like that. Uh, and the report only said that yeah. and showed video, something like that. Everybody will, is like, oh my gosh, police brutality and so forth. Uh, but if you also show the omitted context that five seconds before that, um, let's say the oh, protesters yeah. were beating the police <laughs> and, and yeah. setting them on fire or something, then that would change the picture, right? And so the thing is you always want to have the entire picture before you leap to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, and that works both ways, right? So I just picked a random example. I could reverse the roles and this would still be accurate. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is the sort of thing that we as humans are very ill-prepared uh, to deal with. It's unconscious. Uh, the framing bias naturally causes us to go uh, according to our preconceptions, it, yeah. you know, our confirmation bias. And what's really insidious, what's really dangerous is other unconscious biases, but the continued influence effect causes us to continue to believe uh, things that we've already been shown counter evidence to. So even if consciously we say, oh, oh yeah, okay, so Maybe I wasn't 100% correct there. Unconsciously, we still go on making inferences based on those uh, prior um, incorrect beliefs. It's way too complicated. I mean, you have a lot of work to do uh, as AI uh, expert, and you know, uh, the, your area has is going to shape the future of our of our societies. But uh, like, I want you to like, and we have just a few minutes left. I want you to just let us know. Um, what kind of a future is expected? What is going to change in the new future uh, um, with the advent of technology? What, what differences are we going to actually experience in our day-to-day -day lives? You know, we're gonna see a lot more use of these online tools. I think people have discovered that there are some really great advantages to these tools. Um, yes, it's not the same as all being in the same room together. Yeah. You know, we're a long way from being able to substitute for that. Um, but I think people have also discovered that a lot of conversations are possible without doing that. I think people have discovered um, that a lot of this new tech is actually um, maturing at a rapid speed. I was yesterday um, given a tour of um, a world uh, in virtual reality. We actually had uh, our, our conference, if you like, our video conference, uh, not oh, via or Google Meet or whatever, we were literally in virtual reality. Oh my God. Uh, sitting out in the middle of a beautiful um, festival land. Uh, everybody had their own avatars. And we we're speaking to each other, turning around, walking around, touring the place uh, while we were having- You actually had an avatar in this virtual world. Yeah, yeah. And you could customize it, it look like you. And yes. Uh, um, and, and, you know, that sort of thing will make it even more natural without uh, the carbon emissions of flying physically uh, for people to have a more human experience. And uh, I think those kinds of things will, uh, they're being propelled this year. The, the amount of progress in that is gonna be huge. Wow. Um, you know, the fact that Zoom's uh, market <laughs> evaluation now is seven times, more than seven times that of the top seven airlines. Uh, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. But, you know, all of that uh, is driving um, the development uh, of these kinds of technologies uh, much faster. And because people are forced to use them, adoption is also going much faster. And these are the kinds of things that we can use to cut down. You know, the fact that people are not driving around doing their individual shopping as much uh, and consolidating delivery 
Uh, yes, there are a lot of economic effects. Um, there are a lot of damages to traditional shops and so forth. Uh, we're going to have to have very hard conversations about that. But reducing our, um, our carbon emissions on uh, fossil fuel based economies, especially, uh, but just energy in general, that's going to be, um, a, I think, a huge benefit, a uh, silver lining of this tragedy that we're going through with the coronavirus. This is very enlightening, uh, Dekai, really, this was amazing. But it also means that we're not going to only take care of our physical selves. Now we're going to have to take care of our virtual pseudo uh, avatars as well. We're going to have more work to do, it seems, uh, in the near, near future in a virtual yeah. world. Our, yeah. Our brains yeah. are going to come together more and more with yeah. our AIs in, uh, in, in um, cyberspace, virtual reality. And uh, uh, half my brain is already there. Um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much helpless without my <laughs> like AI. <laughs> oh my god, this is incredible. Uh, so we better take care of our uh, combined mental health as well. That is so important. Yes, it's important to be centered. It's important to uh, also do a lot of internal work because it's going to be very exponential, this whole change that is coming up. Yeah. But the good thing is we don't have to wear shoes while we're having meetings like these ones. That's an advantage, I guess. <laughs> yes, and that's a great cultural bias that maybe you could transfer. Yeah, uh, East true. Asian countries who all remove their shoes anyway yes. before going inside. The West will turn into that as well. All right. Okay. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time that you connected with us from uh, all the way in Hong Kong. I hope soon uh, things will you know, open up and you can go back to Berkeley. Uh, you've been away for a long time and, uh, and hope to see you here in Turkey soon in our, in our uh, summit. Uh, and we don't know when it will open up, but uh, uh, hopefully at the end of this year. Looking forward to that. Thank you, Dekai. Thank you. Thank you, John.